Hello, everybody, and welcome to Investing with IBD podcast, sponsored by Direction. It's Justin Nielsen here, and it is October 26th, 2022. And joining me, as always, is Arusha Pires. He is a portfolio manager at O'Neill Global Advisors. How are you doing, Arusha? Uh, I'm doing well, Justin. Uh, ho- hopefully, you're getting ready for a little Halloween here. Uh, yes, my my son is going as John Cena, so maybe we'll have oh, to talk nice. about WWE a little bit later on today. Um, Arusha and I will be uh, finishing the segments out with a little market talk and stocks. But before we do that, we're actually going to have a little something different here. Uh, we're going to have Ryan Williams join us. Ryan is a founder and CEO of Cadre. So Ryan is involved in the real estate business, and I met him uh, while we were at a Market Watch event in New York. Um, um, we, we sat down, we were chatting for a while, and I was really interested in what he's doing in the real estate uh, area, kind of making this available for retail investors. So I'd like to really welcome you to the show here, Ryan. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So we're going to spend a, a little bit of time uh, to kind of understand what's happening in the real estate business, especially a lot of uh, a lot of people have been looking at that as, I mean, sure, the rates are going up, but with inflation as high as it is, uh, that's one of the things that a lot of people are looking at that inflation hedge. So maybe you can start us out, Ryan, by talking a little bit about making the case for real estate. You know, a lot of our audience, of course, a lot of our listeners is, uh, you know, they're, they're into stocks and stuff. So why should real estate be something that they put as part of their asset diversification? Yeah, absolutely. I, I also own a, a ton of, of stocks and equities. Um, and uh, I believe it's critical to have a truly healthy financial portfolio that you have diversification. Um, diversification in equities, but of course, diversification outside of equities as well. Um, and so, you know, institutions and you know, everyone has their own definition for what institutions entail, typically are investing 10 up to 15 percent at least in real assets like real estate uh, within their portfolios. Individuals tend to be, um, you know, a fraction of that. Some uh, uh, research has individuals at two or three percent. Some have them at five, six percent, regardless um, there's clearly an underallocation amongst individuals and institutions have gotten why uh, real estate is such an important part of portfolios. And I think now it's time for individuals to do the same. And the main benefits of real estate are it's a tangible asset. Um, it is an excellent hedge against inflation um, and uh, it provides unique tax benefits. There's actually no other um, asset class like real estate in terms of the depreciation benefits that it provides the end investors who can basically shield, um, you know, their losses. Um, they basically can, uh, you know, create more capital and cash for themselves come uh, tax season uh, and still have an appreciating asset as well. Um, so uh, overall, what I always tell people is if you want to have uh, diversification, a hedge against inflation, um, you know, tax advantages, and then income and yield oriented uh, real estate without having to do a lot of the work associated with owning apartment buildings yourself, platforms like mine cadre um, are some of the best avenues to uh, to do that. So, Ryan, how, how did you get started in real estate? Uh, I mean, you started out uh, getting into real estate pretty young, right? Yes. I mean, I, I don't come from a, a family with uh, real estate money or really any money for that matter. Um, and I actually stumbled on real estate while I was an undergraduate um, during the subprime credit crisis. So I'd been Uh, developing a curriculum to help teach undergraduates uh, the basics of real estate trading, investment banking, because I went to a liberal arts school where we didn't learn some of these practical um, uh, sort of fields. And I got up the curve on real estate. uh, Mm -hmm. And what I realized pretty quickly is that most millionaires um, in our world made their money through real estate. And the best way to pass on wealth is through ownership of real estate. Uh, And and, you know, I kind of uh, looked at that dynamic and then saw all the distress around us during the credit crisis. And I said, you know what, this could be an amazing opportunity uh, to build wealth um, for myself, for others like myself who didn't come from this kind of money, because there's so many distressed real estate assets around the country. Now, the issue is I didn't have any money. So uh, fortunately, I went to a school with a lot of um, uh, peers who did have liquidity and money. And I was in Atlanta, Georgia with my roommate between semesters, and I saw these foreclosed homes 
up and down his street and um, started doing some research and realized, you know, we could bid on these um, and we could buy them for pennies on the dollar um, and made that case to some classmates who ultimately uh, took a chance on me. I raised $65,000 to buy my first home in Atlanta in early 2009. Um, I rented that home back out actually to another member um, of that community. And um, as a result of, you know, that deal and being able to rent that house back out, that individual is able to build her wealth up. She bought the house back from us, sort of rent to buy construct. We made about three times our money. Um, and then once you make investors money, uh, they tend to give you more. And so uh, from there, I was able to raise a lot more money um, from those same investors, start graduating to buy multifamily apartment complexes. Um, start doing larger deals, hundreds of units we were buying. Um, and uh, throughout the entire process, uh, what, I, what I realized is that real estate was able to help uh, build wealth for me, despite the ups and downs of the market. Um, and uh, after catching the eye of Blackstone, who eventually hired me, um, I said, you know what, it's time to make institutional real estate available to the masses. I don't want it to just be a sector for the people who are just fortunate enough to get into the network and know the right people or exceptional enough to you know work at one of these private equity firms i wanted every individual to be able to have a more healthy portfolio um, and i believe real estate uh, is a critical linchpin to doing that so ryan um let, let's talk a little bit about okay you've got uh you've got your single family home you've got your multi-family homes and i guess one of the things that you know, for the individual investor, a lot of times, I mean, a lot of them start with the single family home, but, you know, you, you kind of get a certain amount of money and then it's, you're, you're kind of all into one. And then the multifamily, it's very difficult to kind of get, a, you know, a, a hundred unit building. I mean, that requires money that's kind of out of reach for uh, a, a lot of people. So I guess, you know, that's that's been a big barrier, right? To to get kind of that diversification in real estate instead of just all in on one property or having these multi out of reach. You know, what what's been the availability for individuals? I mean, the first thing I think of is REITs, real estate investment trusts. So that's right. maybe you that's could right. talk a little bit about that, and you know, and then we can get into how Cadre is a little bit different. Yeah, definitely. There there are really three ways. Um, for most individuals to invest in real estate. Um, the first way is uh, you know the right people. You get into a club deal, you bring some money to the table, um, and you know you sort of in a syndicate format are able to raise money and buy an apartment building. Um, the second way beyond doing club deals um, is investing in REITs. Um, and as you mentioned, you know REITs are, are generally accessible. Um, their stocks, they're correlated to the equity markets. And, uh, and so you actually don't get some of the diversification away from the equity markets that you, you, uh, um, you would hope you would by investing in an alternative asset class. And then the third way people can invest in real estate um, is by um, doing it themselves, you know, going out and trying to buy and manage and you know, do all the work themselves. Each of those ways are inefficient. Each of those ways are broken. Um, the first uh, way of, of doing club deals, it's just incredibly operationally intensive. You know, you're spending time, you know, putting money in a pool and, you know, getting all the documents for the partnership together. And, you know, if something goes wrong with the property, uh, maybe you're not getting a phone call, but someone in your syndicate is. And, you know, all it takes is one or two HVAC units to go out to erode your cash flow and yield. And so it's really just tough to scale, not to mention there's adverse selection oftentimes with uh, those club deals, because the reason uh, sellers oftentimes come to those club syndicates is because larger buyers who are more programmatic uh, won't buy the properties themselves. So I saw that that was problematic. Um, and, and I'm assuming uh, that's where you kind of started. Kind of that's exactly that right. Yeah. Deal. And for me, right. it was exactly, I started uh, basically doing those club deals and and you know, I was the one who was answering the phone calls if you know something went wrong. And so, so when you say um, operational nightmares, oh, wow. you were the operational guy. You were, you were getting up like at <laughs> yes. three in the morning and going to fix toilets. I was fixing all kinds of things, plus dealing with a lot of the investors in the syndicates, yes. providing yeah. the reports, the K ones, the tax docs. So you know, you you realize pretty quickly that it's actually not a great way um, to uh, you know spend your your time and to scale. 
And well, so, it was really good learning lessons, I'm sure. There, it was it's amazing. Kind of it was amazing learning, learning. Right. and and you, you you know, there's nothing really to replace that kind of learning. But yeah, um, if you can uh, grow your wealth, you know, get access to income oriented real estate without that painful learning, um, you know, it, it's it's it makes for a much better much better lifestyle, um, especially if your your full time job is something other than real estate, which in a lot of cases mine was. Um, you know, so I was working as a banker at Goldman Sachs during the day and at night running these real estate syndicates. So just wasn't conducive to sleep or, or a good lifestyle. But <laughs> but um, but that was one avenue that you could use to invest in real estate. And then investing in REITs, uh, REITs serve their purpose. Uh, if you want broad access to the real estate sector or you like a certain property type, maybe office or mm. industrial, you can kind of go all in there. But the issue with REITs are number one, they don't give you the tax benefits, the direct appreciation that owning properties outright directly, you know, through a platform like ours do. Um, number two, incentive management fees are, are pretty high. So that erodes a lot of the returns that you would hope to get because it cuts into your cash flow. And then number three, it's really tough to get diversification um, because REITs typically specialize in one sector or one asset class or one geography. Um, and, uh, and then of course they're correlated to the equity markets. So if you want to diversify a bit, um, beyond being in the equity markets, then again, the REITs aren't your best answer. The final option doing it yourself, um, you know, that's sort of operational pain on a different level, um, because <laughs> you're literally the money, the operator, um, you know, and everything else in between. And so what we've tried to do is provide a direct, um, transparent, and still scalable solution for people to have fractional stakes in real estate buildings um, around the country, and really to be that you know professional manager um, that oftentimes you know you need seven figures or even more to invest with and alongside, um, and do so you know again in sectors and geographies that we think uh, will be counter cyclical and defensive, um, and especially in this environment of high volatility. So what, was there a change in the in the laws or in the industry that all of a sudden kind of enabled this? Because I feel like over the last three, four years, we're, we're seeing more of these opportunities start to come available for individual investors that this was not a possibility like 10 years ago. That's right. Yeah. So So there was the real sort of landmark legislation that kind of opened up the floodgates. Um, you know, the floodgates didn't fully open up until more recently, as you, you pointed out, but uh, was the 2012 Jobs Act. Um, so the Jobs Act basically made it much easier um, to raise money for private placements, um, you know, and to do so online and to basically lower a lot of the barriers um, that that existed for individuals to invest in alternative assets. It, um, the, 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 the Jobs Act made um, investing in real estate or even private equity or credit, any alternative asset, um, much more accessible because you now could invest, um, you know, uh, at lower minimums, especially if you were accredited already so that, you know, you were seen as a suitable investor. Um, you could invest uh, without having to go through a bunch of intermediaries um, and you could do it digitally as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Jobs Act opened up this, this possibility for individuals to invest um, in real estate the issue was that a lot of the early companies in the space that you know leveraged the Jobs Act, um, they didn't think about curation. They didn't think about vetting. They didn't think about their selection criteria. Oh, uh, like in the equities market, a great management team, um, you know, a great uh, manager can drive out performance, but they can also drive underperformance. And so many of the real estate offerings that were being provided to people, um, you know, were not real estate offerings I'd put my mother or grandmother in or recommend or suggest that they invested in. And because I worked at Blackstone and saw, you know, kind of the gold standard for private real estate investing, um, I knew what kind of criteria um, you would need to build a sustainable business. And that's the biggest differentiator with us is we started with accredited investors, giving them access to multifamily properties, uh, like apartment buildings and high growth markets, industrial buildings, um, hotels, and uh, in investing again in these faster growing markets, not uh, just throwing anything against the wall and, and saying, look, people, now you have access, so jump into this um, mm -hmm. and you should be grateful for it. I want institutional real estate to be something that anyone can invest in. Mm -hmm. 
So you, you talked about some of the ways in which real estate is segmented. And so maybe maybe you could just kind of describe some of that. I mean, we, we've kind of touched on some of them already. There's, of course, the single family homes. Um, there's the multifamily homes where you're talking about apartments. There's the hospitality. There's kind of more of the commercial industrial side office space. Um, now, those aren't necessarily correlated with each other either. I mean, a lot of people have been very concerned with uh, the commercial side, you know, especially after the pandemic. And are people going to return to the office? Is there going to be the need for, you know, all this office space? Um, you know, on the on the real estate, you know, the, the multifamily, I mean, a lot of people were saying, look, you know, some of these people just because the rates have been raised are going to be priced out of single family homes. They're going to be renting for a long time. So maybe you could talk about what you see right now in terms of that segmentation and where the opportunities are uh, in, in, in your mind. Absolutely. I think you, you nailed, Justin, just the important dynamic associated with real estate, which is that investing in real estate means you're investing in effectively a menu of um, sectors. You know, you're not necessarily getting, you know, any one sector, or any one geography, uh, which makes it all the more important to have you know, a manager, a platform that's discerning, that's vetting and picking and choosing uh, the right sectors for that market period. Um, and real estate broadly, uh, there's, you know, residential real estate space. Um, in the residential real estate space, you know, we consider single family homes um, and then apartment buildings or multifamily homes. So your multifamily dwellings and um, uh, multi-unit um, uh, dwellings as well. Uh, there's office uh, as you mentioned, there's industrial uh, warehouses, for instance, um, considered industrial. There's retail, which you know, everyone knows has been a struggling space with the, the emergence of e-commerce and the growth and scale of e-commerce, especially during the pandemic and how that accelerated. Um, there's some more niche sectors like student housing, um, uh, you know, seniors living, self-storage, um, life sciences office. So there's a huge menu of sectors um, it, within the real estate world. And where we see the opportunities today are really in those defensive sectors that um, you know, have uh, seen a ton of growth through up and downturns um, as well. So you think about multifamily as one of those spaces where uh, despite you know, the fact that mortgage and interest rates are at significant highs and have you know, doubled over the last six months or so, um, people still uh, need somewhere to stay and st still need somewhere to live. And they're not graduating anymore to buying homes because it is out of reach for a lot of people. Uh, but instead, they're renewing their rent. In some cases, their rents are going up. Hence, you know, the inflation hedge, um, you know, despite the fact that inflation is going up. And we've seen across our portfolio at Cadre, which is um, uh, almost half multifamily, that uh, our, our rents and our occupancies have been incredibly high. Um, and growing, frankly, over the last few quarters in particular. So multifamily is a space that we think is one of the winners, um, despite the turbulence and where we always um, encourage our, our investors to, to deploy money to on our platform. Um, the second space that we think is, is a winner is industrial, um, especially, you know, sort of the last mile logistics distribution right. centers as well. Um, and especially given all the issues we've seen with supply chain and and the fact of the matter is that, you know, even if you're not a physical storefront, you still need space for your inventory to ship and your warehouse um, to ship. So a lot of small businesses will continue to need industrial space. Um, and there's going to be good that, you know, people just can't go without. Um, and so we like industrial, especially if these are kind of consumer goods oriented industrial assets. Um, the third sector that we like is uh, self-storage. Self-storage, you know, people uh, are, are, are always going to need somewhere to store, uh, you know, leftover, uh, you know, whatever your, your item is. Um, We're a consumer society. We get a lot of yeah. stuff, right? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> or stuff and, that we don't need. And then, and then you don't really want to have to go and move it after you kind of find. So self-storage yeah. is a great space, as is hotel. So hospitality, which is a space during the pandemic, I would have said stay away from because, you know, people weren't traveling. We actually have seen a huge boom. Um, across many of our hotel properties uh, because people are basically um, staying within the U.S. They're not traveling outside the country as much. They're the drive to and drive through leisure markets like Savannah, Georgia, Nashville, Tennessee, um, and, you know, Charleston, South Carolina, 
uh, where if you own a hotel there, you know, you're seeing occupancy rates at all times highs. You're seeing average daily rates at all time highs. And that's another sector we like a lot. In terms of the spaces that we're less bullish on, um, you know, you can probably guess those. Office is big city office where we've stayed away from. Uh, retail has been a falling knife for a while, although there are some interesting ways to repurpose retail. Um, yeah. And uh, and then, you know, within hotels, the big business oriented hotels where they require international travel, right. those right. hotels have suffered as well. Um, but you do see this barbell effect in real estate, um, which is you know part of the opportunity. But it's also why uh, the people who sort of overgeneralize and say, you know, real estates get challenged because of what's going on in the interest, the mortgage um, uh, space are missing out on an opportunity. They're missing out on all those sectors that I discussed that have outperformed um, the S&P over periods of time and volatility. But um, again, give people a nice hedge against inflation. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the risks that are involved with real estate. Uh, you got to got to talk about that side of things um, and uh, some more about the way this is changing and access for retail investors. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Direction. It's Justin Nielsen here along with my weekly special guest. It's Arusha Pierce and our really, really, really special guest (laughs) this week. (laughs) Not that Arusha is not special, special. but even specialer. Uh, (laughs) It's Ryan Williams, uh, founder and CEO of Cadre, uh, a real estate platform uh, that is kind of allowing retail investors to get involved in real estate more. So, uh, you know, before we go too much further, um, we, we have to kind of put up those warning signs, right? The, the risks and everything like that so that people are understanding, you know, look, you know, real estate is great and long term, uh, it, it produces some great returns. But what are the risks for a lot of retail investors, um, you know, getting into real estate? I mean, we talked about it when you're doing it on your own. And certainly, yep. Part of the problem is it's hard to diversify, right? You're yep. a lot of times in a single property. Um, but what, what are some other risks uh, that people should know about, especially with this very changing environment between mortgage rates skyrocketing, inflation rates being up so much, the pandemic uh, aftermath, supply chains, I mean, you name it. Uh, what, what, yep. should, what should these guys know about? Yeah, I would say the biggest single risk historically within real estate is that it, it's a liquid. Um, yeah. So, you know, if you go into... Uh, uh, buying one of these um, multifamily units or your own house, you know, there's no uh, quick liquidity switch to be able to get money out um, as you need. And, and of course, there are people who are trying to build solutions. We've built a secondary marketplace, but the reality is that um, there's no uh, quick, efficient liquidity, unlike you know the equities market, where you know you can you can uh, get liquidity you know within hours or days. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd say that's that's risk number one. I'd say the other is, um, you know, real estate is a, a space in a sector where, um, you know, if you don't understand or if you don't have a great steward looking out for you deploying capital, um, you know, you can lose all your money. You can get wiped out. Uh, you know, if you ended up, for instance, investing in a shopping center um, a few years ago, you know, those spaces and asset classes have fallen so hard that uh, it'll be really hard to recoup your principal, your, your, your value, because there's a lack of liquidity. You're sort of at the, um, you know, you're, you're at the beck and call of whoever is running the property day to day as to whether or not, you know, they're going to increase the, the value of it such that you could recoup your principal. Um, and then I think the final risk that, you know, we always call out for people um, is that, you know, there are, um, uh, a lot of tax and local ordinances in certain areas, zoning restrictions um, that can change based off of you know different um, politics, right? So right. you could have uh, invested in a multifamily property in Los Angeles, um, thinking that you know the current zoning rules made it really hard for other people to to build other competing multifamily, um, and that can be. Ch- Changed. You know, someone can come in and say, you know what, I actually want to expand 
um, you know, the zoning um, uh, sort of framework so that anybody can come in and build and you can see a lot of value eroded. So just understanding that real estate's a hyper local, um, almost street by street business. It just means that you need to be working with people who really have teams and great um, boots of ground who understand yeah. everything happening in the market. Um, so those are some of the key risks. So what, what about being an accredited investor? Because you 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 highlighted all these risks. And so a, a one reason that you had to be an accredited investor in the past was you had to be a little bit more quote unquote sophisticated, right? Do you still need to be an accredited investor to uh, invest and take advantage of so, some of these opportunities? Short answer is no. I mean, one of the exciting dynamics about real estate uh, investing with you know, some of the, the new legislation, the Jobs Act and others, um, and some of the new products that have been developed is that, you know, anyone uh, can invest in real estate. Uh, you don't have to be accredited anymore. Um, and uh, that's great. It also presents some risks because, you know, there are a lot of people who are um, sharks, frankly, in the space who are looking to find people who don't really know how to discern and pick and choose right. uh, managers, properties, geographies. Um, but there are uh, increasingly products, we're launching our, our first ever called the Cadre Horizon Fund um, that give individuals accredited and non-accredited alike um, the ability to invest in uh, direct real estate portfolios, get good income, um, and get the long-term yield and growth that real estate provides. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about how you've set up uh, the, the Cadre you know, Cadre itself and specifically the Cadre Horizon, since that is available to retail investors and non-accredited investors. Um, you know, so, you know, is it is it that they just basically trust you to to build the portfolio for them? Or is there, you know, an a la carte menu, I guess, like I, I want to I want to be in this area, but not this area. Yeah. Um, how, how does that work exactly for uh, for the investor to make make some decisions, you know, but you know, not have all of the, I guess, the, the, the risks involved. Absolutely. So, so I founded the business in 2014. And when I started um, Cadre, initially, we were focusing on larger, more quote unquote, sophisticated investors. Mm -hmm. um, so all accredited, even some institutions, and giving them the ability to invest deal by deal. So pick and choose a la carte. Um, and, uh, and that was really to prove out the model to show that it was possible to invest through this technology interface we built that just made it more transparent um, so everyone could see each deal and each property type and the growth and the business plan. Um, the analogy I've used is almost like getting a, a, a baseball card that um, gave you all the stats and all the data and the images of a given property. And you could say, you know what, I want that baseball card. I want to buy you know, a, a stake in that building. Um, and that was the predominant way people invested, deal by deal, had to be high net worth up until about 2018. And then in 2018, Goldman Sachs approached us and you know, they said, we really like what you're doing. Um, would we be able to give our clients access to a portfolio of real estate offerings? So we said, well, of course. Um, and uh, we built the portfolio for those clients and for, for dozens of others, raised hundreds of millions in capital and let people build um, their own separate managed accounts where they could invest in 15 to 20 properties. They told us their risk appetite, and then we bundled these portfolios together. Um, and then we decided that, you know, we wanted to bring these portfolio offerings to a wider range of investors um, at lower minimum. So during the pandemic, we launched the Cadre Direct Access Fund, uh, raised a few hundred million dollars, had folks like Harvard and BlackRock and um, some foundations invest, but we also had a large number of high net worth investors invest for $25,000 in a portfolio of about 15 properties. Um, they still had to be accredited. Um, mm -hmm. But in that scenario, you could either get access to this, you know, fund offering um, that has uh, now generated um, more than 40% uh, net IRRs for our investors, almost doubled their money based off some of the sales that we've offered um, to those, those LPs and clients. Um, or you could pick and choose properties that were also in the fund. So we'd hold back a little bit of equity. So it was, you know, kind of like a, a passive investing um, sort of experience, which is the fund, the portfolio, or active investing, picking and choosing. Um, and, you know, because we've amassed more than $4 billion of real estate and we've um, allowed thousands of individuals to invest, you know, I made the decision that 
um, I wanted to now take the next step in our growth. So we'll be the only platform in the sector in the world, as far as I know, where individuals can directly invest alongside some of these larger institutions. And they're able to do this through like retirement accounts and, and things like that, or is it, is it outside of that stuff? Yeah. So, so, you know, individuals can go to cadre.com, um, C-A-D-R-E.com and, and basically sign up once they give us um, just, you know, verification ID, um, you know, they're, they're in, you know, you don't need to pay a subscription fee. You don't need to, you know, know the right people and, you know, um, uh, and have that network. Um, we want anyone to be able to invest and we want people to be invest to be able to invest uh, through different means and avenues as well. So mm -hmm. you can invest directly, you can invest through your IRA, um, you can invest through your advisor. Uh, if you have an, an advisor or someone who helps manage your money, um, you know, or you can invest uh, in through a trust, you know, or you're, you're and so we, we've set the, the fund up such that, um, you know, the biggest number of people, the greatest number of folks can, can invest in high quality real estate, um, and, uh, and benefit the same way some of the larger family office and institutions have historically and through our platform, frankly, as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to get into something that you mentioned earlier. You were talking about kind of the ability to uh, solve the illiquid problem by kind of building the secondary market. And um, one of the challenges I expect is kind of that valuation of, of the properties. Uh, I mean, one of the things that just as, as I started getting into real estate, and again, this is because of my wife, you know, she's she's been in commercial real estate for a while. And, um, you know, it, she had to really kind of sit me down and slap me over the head a couple of times because the valuation thing is so different with commercial properties, um, you know, versus, you know, residential, you know, single family home, your, your, your personal residence, you think of, oh, I got to go get the comps and, you know, an appraisal and everything like that. Whereas, uh, you know, with, with the commercial property, a lot of times it's about your occupancy or, um, you know, everything like that, the distressed properties, um, you know, it, it's, it's a low occupancy and you can, you know, raise that occupancy and boom, the valuation just changes. So how, how do you kind of do that to create a secondary market and have that valuation done appropriately, I guess. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Your wife is, is spot on about the, the valuation dynamics. Um, we, we have quarterly valuations. We go through a okay. pretty rigorous process internally where we're getting real-time data across every property we own. Plus, we're overlaying that with market data. So what's going on um, you know, from a, a growth perspective, a cap rate perspective in that respective market? And then we're coming to a net asset value um, that we then um, have sort of validated by a number of auditors and third-party appraisers as well. So it's not just the cadre opinion of value. You know, <laughs> right. We've also had um, others as well say, this is something that can be defended. Here's all the supporting data. Um, and that valuation is, uh, I think, you know, frankly, uh, as rigorous um, as, as any I've seen. Um, it's our way to, mark, to market the assets themselves. Um, and it's not just our opinion and that ultimately is what investors can trade um, uh, on, right? They can trade at discounts or premiums to that net asset value. Um, you know, we've had hundreds of investors use our secondary market, which doesn't exist in any other platform. Um, and it was a long, arduous process to be able to offer liquidity quarterly to our investors and the opportunity to have liquidity. Um, but basically we see this as, you know, sort of a, um, an exit or escape valve to the extent life circumstances change or people want to reallocate or rebalance. But it's a pretty arduous, rigorous process. Uh, we go above and beyond to make sure that we can support the values that we list and we have other third parties do the same as well. What about competition? So uh, I'm, I'm assuming there, there are a number of players starting to come into this and, and really competing for, for the, a number of the clients that you have or you might be trying to get. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I think with that technology kind of advantage that you were talking about and offering this secondary market, that's a real kind of cool differentiator. But you know, talk, talk about kind of the competition. Is it, is it really, really competitive right now or, or is it starting to kind, kind of uh, slow down and bigger players are starting to rise up? Yeah, so from a competition perspective, um, what I would say is that uh, what, what ultimately matters is trust. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the platform that builds the most trust with investors will be the one that ultimately is 
um, you know, the, the fastest growing can scale the best and trust comes from performance. Yep. And in our case, you know, we generated um, 27 and a half percent plus net IRRs for our investors. There's no other online real estate investing platform that's anywhere near those consistent returns that we've been able to generate. And so what we oftentimes see is that a lot of our the investors that we um, are talking to, they're, they're looking at private equity funds as the alternative. Um, oh, you know, okay. some of the big institutions uh, who do have a pretty strong track record, those are the folks that, um, you know, have the most comparable performance to Cadre. The challenge with many of those, those private equity firms is none offer a very efficient, direct way to invest in their funds or their properties. You need to either have a lot of money, um, and I'm talking like high seven figures, low eight figures type money, you need to invest through an intermediary like, you know, a wirehouse or a bank or an advisor, um, or you need to work there. And so in Cadre's case, we're able to offer people the ability to directly invest in these buildings um, for fractional stakes or in portfolios or funds without the middlemen that, you know, can eat away a lot of the returns. Um, and to do so uh, with a platform that has a credible, you know, team, you know, our our and team has more than forty billion of deal experience. Um, I co-chair our investment committee alongside with Mike Facitelli. Mike used to be the CEO um, of Ornado and head of Goldman's real estate group. So we're bringing this institutional real estate to the masses, um, and in some ways, we're kind of in a class of one uh, in that you know we're not a, a crowdfunding website that's just you know putting anything on the platform and, and saying buyer beware, um, and we're not a private equity fund in that. You know, we're not charging multiple layers of carry and promote. We do offer liquidity and we let people directly invest. We think as long as we continue to deliver good performance, you know, we'll continue to see the growth and exponential growth of our, our investor base. Um, and we'll be the you know household name for any individual looking to access private real estate and be able to build um, a portfolio where they have not just equities or crypto, but also uh, alternatives to give them diversification, the hedge against inflation, and good yield and income in an environment where that's pretty challenging to achieve otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're, you're, you're throwing some big numbers out there in terms of returns. Uh, you know, I mean, 27, 28, that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. Um, now, that, that was also in this big kind of boom, right, uh, that, that we had, you know, we had these ridiculously low rates for a long time. Um, so, can you talk about going forward, you know, what what kind of changes? I mean, do you think do you think it's realistic to expect those kind of returns going forward? Um, do you think I mean, with the rate changes go, you know, with the rates going up, does that change the math on how profitable, you know, some of these deals are? Because, you know, a lot of times, I mean, real estate, it's about leverage, right? And if you're, uh, you know, if you're using that money, you know, that borrowed money as your leverage and the rates change, I mean, that changes that just changes the math on everything. So can you talk a little bit about those those two things? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we by no means are promising uh, or even forecasting uh, 27 and a half, 28 percent type net returns to our investors. And in fact, if you look at our underwriting, you know, the initial sort of forecast and projections we showed for each of those properties um, that make up that uh, portfolio that we've, we've sold over the you know, every single one we were hundreds of basis points below what we ultimately generated. So we, we always work to under promise, um, over deliver. And um, what I would say is going forward, it's going to be much tougher. There's no question about it uh, to be able to generate outsized returns because so much of the cash flow um, that many of these properties generated uh, was propped up by low rates. Um, mm -hmm. And so you had positive leverage and there are properties that we've seen that we've passed on where you almost have negative leverage because the debt's more than the cash flow and mm -hmm. you know your unlevered return is, is much better um, or at least much closer in line to your levered return. So I say all that to say um, I think that the next couple of years in particular they're really going to show um, you know who's taken a prudent approach to investing, who's financially engineered returns, who's generated good um, operating turns based off of um, doing things like doing strong renovations of properties and making sure they're being managed to the op optimal points, um, making sure there's not excessive costs, but you're still investing in right amenities. And so what we like to pride ourselves on is we find the best local operators and developers in every market around the country. We work, we partner, we align them 
we give them great economics. Uh, we give them more controls than they would get if they were to work with just any traditional fund. Uh, and we let them do what they do best. We think just like in the equity markets, great management teams can outperform. The other thing we do beyond focusing on the operational side of value is um, we work in a way that um, we think is is much more responsible from a leverage perspective. You know, we're not levering these properties up 70 percent or 75 or 80 percent. Um, and the reason that we're not levering them that way is because we don't have to, because unlike some of the traditional private equity funds, we don't have multiple layers of carry and promote as another innovation that we launched, um, you know, in, in real estate, uh, you know, or I guess in, in hedge fund world, you hear about the two and 20 in the real estate private equity firm, there's a double two and 20. There's a two and 20 at the fund level. And then the operators who run the properties, they actually get a two and 20 as well. So I, I said, you know, I think it's crazy to be able to, you know, pay that much in fees to all those different people. So I want to build a business where there's just one two and 20, if you will, which means that we're up to 30% lower in terms of fees than traditional funds, which means we don't have to take the same level uh, of leverage or financial risk um, to generate 13, 14, 15% type returns. I always say not all 13% IRRs um, or returns are created equally. If you can generate that kind of return with lower leverage, um, then you can do so in a more responsible way. So we do think that we'll be able to generate alpha, um, you know, great management, lower leverage. And then the final piece is just, um, we, we believe in our methodology of market selection. We just um, announced the launch of our latest MVP, the most valuable places, um, which are our top markets around the country uh, that we've used um, to really you know, pursue investments. Um, and we think if you pick the right markets, the right geographies and have conviction um, uh, that you can find pockets of growth, you can also generate great outsized returns. Um, by no means am I saying that that means 27 and a half or 28 percent returns, but I am saying that I think, you know, relative to alternatives, um, you know, in uh, equities and in other real estate options, we feel really good about our ability to deliver alpha. Yeah. Well, Ryan, got to just say, I really enjoyed talking to you when we met out in new york uh thank you so much for going coming on the show here today uh it's it's definitely something that i think our audience is not as familiar with i mean some some of our folks are i mean like the reality is some of our folks have made their money in real estate and yeah. they're using stocks to diversify their, right exactly. their portfolio exactly. in that regard um then there's you know i mean for for me you know i've i've made more money in stocks and now i'm like okay let me try and diversify a little bit more into real estate so uh some very helpful information and uh where where should people go to get maybe some more information to kind of understand sure. uh how the real estate markets work and uh yeah. you know specifically you know your what what you're doing here yeah, absolutely. People should go um, to cadre.com, C-A-D-R-E.com. We actually have um, a hub for information, education, content. The Cadre Insights blog actually gives a great overview of, um, you know, the various ways that people can understand certain asset classes and sectors. Um, and then the Cadre Horizon Fund, uh, people can sign up and invest in that on our platform as well. And so you can kind of both get the democratization of investments, but also the democratization of insights as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's all there on the website, the platform, and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to you and all your listeners as well. Great. Well, thanks again, Ryan, for, uh, for being here. Thank you. When we come back, Arusha and I are going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the market, and we'll talk about a few stocks that are on our radar. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Direction. It's Justin Nielsen here and Arusha Pires, Portfolio Manager at O'Neill Global Advisors, my weekly special guest. And I'm going to call you the, the, the most special now since uh, uh, since Ryan's uh, off now. So, so, so now I'll you're my favorite. It. I'll take it. Yeah, 
exactly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the market and uh, some stocks. Uh, first, the market. I mean, geez, we uh, we had a follow through day on Friday. Uh, so it's a very different look to what we were seeing before. I think uh, I think we we all started kind of getting a little bit of a spring into our step, um, started looking a little bit you know better. Uh, that follow through day was you know pretty powerful and. On Tuesday, we got a subsequent follow through day on the NASDAQ composite. Um, we cleared that 21 day moving average line. Now, granted, there's a lot of hurdles that we still have to clear. Um, yeah. We got right up to that 50 day moving average line, 10 week line on the NASDAQ S&P 500. Um, you know, <laughs> today's action. Um, look, we had it's earnings season. So we had Google, Microsoft, you know, uh, you know a number of those big, heavy tech weight that we're just really putting a lot of pressure on the indexes today. But, you know, earlier in the session, I mean, it really seemed like we were we were fighting back. And despite the 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 downdraft, a lot of stocks were still going up. What's your take on what's happening right now? Uh, well, I it, I always feel like it is kind of normal action after a fall through day. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's it's rare that you see a fall. Oh, a fall today that has worked in the past where it was all kind of clear sailing, right? Yeah. It, it, the markets will always do something, especially in those first few weeks to make you question everything still, right? Even if the, even if the setups are really, really good. Uh, so I, I still think it's kind of normal action. Yes. You, today was not ideal, right? At first it started out ideal, right? So we, we had uh, the Microsoft news when they reported, uh, yesterday, so the markets were down big, uh, and this morning, but they recovered pretty quickly and they went positive. And I'm sure we were all thinking the same thing. Wow, this is a really, really strong market. Let's buy more. Yeah. Uh, but by the end of the day, at least on the Nasdaq, it closed right near the lows. When you look at the, the S and P, yeah, it closed right near the lows. Then the S and P hit the 50 day moving average, got slightly above it. But close below. Uh, so when you look on a day, kind of disappointing. But when you kind of take a step back and look, this is this is still pretty normal expected action. It, it, when I, we're showing the S and P 500 right now on the chart, it it was pretty much a really strong run over the last few days, right up to the 50 day. So yeah. it getting above and then maybe reversing, and it reversed on it looks like lower volume. I, I think the market's taking a little bit of a break and maybe trying to go sideways for a week or so would be relatively would be kind of constructive here to try to take that next leg higher. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, who who who's the leading index right now. It still seems like the Nasdaq has kind of this weight, you know, holding yeah. it down in, in the big tech names, um, you know, that that's that's kind of making it lag a little bit. The S and P 500 that cleared its 21 day line before the Nasdaq did. It, it's got you know as you mentioned, it got up to its 50 day and above today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average um, that was kind of the first one to do it. I mean, it got you know it got clear already, um, and you know that that one was you know clearing its 21 day first. It cleared its 50 day moving average line earlier this week, um, and then the Russell. The Russell 2000 small caps, those were looking interesting as well. Um, if we look at uh, IWM, the iShares Russell 2000 ETF, uh, that cleared its two, its its a uh, 50 day moving average line today, and it looks like it closed just above it. Uh, so, you know who's who's the winner, and do you think it's going to stay that way? Because a lot of times, as you said, uh, the follow through day takes some time to really get growth uh, in gear. Um, so what, what's what's your take on who's winning right now? Yeah, I, I think I would eliminate the Dow Jones since we really don't look at it too much. Yeah. Uh, but it's had a really strong move. I mean, 30 stocks and a number of those stocks. There are some energy stocks in that, so it can have a, a pretty big impact. I think I'd probably lean more towards the small caps, the IWM, the Russell 2000. Uh, as the, It seemed like that was holding up the best during this sell-off over the last couple of months. Uh, and it's closing above the 50 day moving average. So I think right now, slightly the small caps, but I also the S&P 500 is uh, acting pretty well. And I think all of this is due to kind of the, just the more energy uh, stocks that uh, like if you pull up, like I'll pull up the XLE right here. 
that's a lead out of all the kind of sector ETFs or the, the sectors that we look at. That's like pretty much the only one <laughs> that's looking okay. Everything else had so much damage. Uh, but here's XLE within striking distance of 52 week highs. Yeah, very different looking. Um, you know what? Just while we're talking about indexes, I'm going to throw one more at you. Let's take a look at VTV, which is the Vanguard Value ETF. Um, oh, and that yeah. one, you know, that one cleared its 50 day moving average line. Scott St. Clair. Uh, brought this up and a I very mean, famous I, value investor, right? Very, so. yeah, exactly. You know, when you got Scott St. Clair talking value, <laughs> you know, then that tells you a little bit of, uh, you know, and and he, and he was saying, look, you know, he's like, I, I think I think the Nasdaq has too much of a a weight with those with those tech names uh, right now, and so he was uh, he was bringing up the Vanguard Value ETF. What's what's your your thoughts on that? I think it's a good call. Scott always seems to find some random uh etf that's doing really really well so he, he has a good eye for really catching some of these uh, leaders that are are kind of going under the radar uh and so you in the etf world right here i i think that, that's a good call i mean that that chart that's a really strong move over the last few weeks here for the the value index and so maybe that's not necessarily a great thing for <laughs> if you're looking for growth stocks when you see the the value etf uh looking like a growth stock but you know, I will say, in defense of uh, in defense of the market, you know, two thousand nine, it was it was a few months before growth That's really true. came on. You know, uh, and 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 this was by no means even comparable to the uh, the the move down and the length uh, that we saw with the financial crisis. But in some ways, you saw very similar destruction in in some of these names where they were mm -hmm. off eighty five ninety percent or more. In you know, in what was kind of considered to be the darlings, you know, the Shopify's and you know, PayPal's and you know, you know, just look at crypto. Uh, so it, it certainly we we saw that destruction in some of the individual names. Um, or heck, look at Arc, you know, the Arc Innovation Fund, you know, Arc K, which which was actually kind of uh, uh, jumping a little bit earlier today. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about some stocks. So we had Ryan on, you know, talking about real estate, and again, one of the things I know from my wife, you know, that they use is CoStar Group. And so that, that kind of jumped on my radar today. It had earnings. Uh, the ticker symbol here is CSGP. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, strong earnings gap up. The The base here was was really mild, a flat base, uh, not, not a huge depth to it. Um, and it just kind of formed right above that 200 day moving average line and had already cleared its 50 day line. Um, what's What's your take on this one? Yeah, I was. Uh, this has been coming up on my radar over the last few months, just because of the the relative strength. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see in the relative strength line, it's been trending higher, uh, and I have it against the the Aqui fund right here. But um, it has been trending pretty well, and so I've been watching it. It had that earnings gap the previous quarter too, uh, but you know I, I was so busy today that I did not see the earnings reaction. And so mm -hmm. when uh, when when you brought this up during our breaks, I was like, wow, that looks that you know those are the type of kind of moves that you want to see and that can you know at least will bring a little bit more confidence to me when, when you start seeing stocks acting like this uh that that's telling me that there's a little bit more risk taking coming into mm -hmm. the market right and uh so so i think it's a positive you're it's breaking out pretty powerfully out of this flat base here uh you're getting the blue dot so it's showing that this is becoming more of a leader in the market and costar in the past has done pretty well uh, and uh it has kind of those growth uh type of aspects that we look for so i, I think that's a positive it's really interesting so it's in many ways it's a database company right so they have all the commercial real estate database so this it's kind of interesting to see kind of a more software-ish type of company doing well so maybe that bodes well for more type of uh, tech related stocks over the next few months mm -hmm. and i mean it's got you know a, a lot of quarters here of some pretty i mean not not bang out numbers you know um, but decent and especially right. in this in this market where you've seen a lot of uh, companies come out and uh, reduce their expectations you know lower their bar um it is surprising to me that the the annual estimate is still down at negative three percent. I wonder if there was any guidance. I haven't looked at the uh, the earnings report. I wonder if there was any guidance that will will change that um, and and turn that positive. But it's got a 90 EPS rating, 
um, decent numbers, a 19% EPS growth rate that's annualized, and the earning stability isn't too bad at 15. That is, you know, on the lower side, um, meaning that it has more stability to those earnings as opposed to uh, like the cyclical companies where you see that the there's no stability, right? It's, you know, it's either up big or it's down big. There's kind of no in between. Um, so this is certainly one for the radar. Um, do you oh, think and, it's extended and, at this point or? No, well, it, from that flat base, it's not necessarily extended. So it is mm -hmm. viable here. We are, we, we, we've had a father day, so we're back in an uptrend. Uh, you have a stock breaking out from a flat base, which is kind of rare in this market right now. Uh, so it, it is viable. Uh, you, I, I think personally, you want to still play small and slowly let your decisions yeah. prove themselves. See if you can get some traction before getting more aggressive. Now, the one thing is, uh, so we I, I pulled it up on a weekly chart here. And I, I kind of drew a line along the 80 area. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pretty significant area that it needs to, a significant area of resistance that it's going to need to deal with. Because uh, that's where it was a previous support area a year yeah. ago where it was kind of forming a big consolidation. And then once it broke through that, uh, it, that that's, it's been pretty much hanging in as a resistance area for the last, I don't know, eight, nine months. So it needs it. There's a bunch of overhead supply there that it, it still needs to work through, uh, and, and so you just want to keep that in mind. If, if this market gets stronger and stronger, it wouldn't be a surprise for CoStar to do better and kind of get, get through that. But that that's the one kind of caution that I see here right now. And and you pointed out the numbers. The numbers aren't amazing, but they're pretty solid. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is at this really critical uh, resistance area. So we have to wait and see how it uh, handles here. And just as a reminder for folks that might be listening to this, uh, you can always take a look at the video where we're showing these charts and Arusha's drawn some lines for you. Uh, that's available at investors.com slash podcast. Uh, let's go ahead and stick with the uh, residential theme, I guess, uh, or, or real estate theme uh, and go with Rollins, uh, R-O-L. Now this is one that I first heard about uh, it's in the model book, you know, from the 60s. This was one that Bill has in How to Make Money in Stocks. Um, I, I don't know if he's had it in every single edition, but I know he's had it in the last, um, I think the last three editions. I'll have to go back and look and see if it was in the first edition. Um, but yeah, this is, I mean, you don't think of this as super exciting. This is, you know, pest and termite control, but you got to protect that house. And you look at that monthly chart and, you know, Holy cow! This is this is something that has had a, a pretty pretty steady uptrend for a very long time. So um, you know, and and today, I mean, gosh, uh, it it had it had its earnings come out, and this was up ten percent today uh, for pest control. So what's uh what's what's your feeling on this? Well, business is booming in the pest industry for sure, or at least for Rollins. Uh, over 20 years, so we have yeah we have that monthly chart up here. Uh, over 20 years, it this has gone on one of the best runs I think. It's one of, one of the best moves I've seen in in charts. So it might be a competition between this and pool because pool was uh, right. that other kind of stock that just seemed to constantly go up and up and up. So it's really really impressive. The character of the stock is is impressive. It looks like it's built building and try and kill merge out of a a year-long base uh on the monthly chart so i, I think that's uh that that is a positive switching over to the daily chart reported earnings it has a strong breakaway gap after the reaction uh up 10 percent volume 172 percent above average so it's a it's a strong move here now the the downside is that it's a termite stuff right <laughs> so when, when you see stocks like this doing really well, a lot of times it just tells me that, and, and it's not the only kind of one, there, there are a number of stocks that are kind of acting like this, that are a little bit more, I guess, more defensive or more boring. They're like really good businesses, but they're, they're not the exciting kind of growth, uh, game-changing type of stocks that we look for in bull markets. And so when I see stocks like this acting, if, this, if, if these are the type of stocks that continue to dominate the new highs list or the stocks breaking out list, then that's just telling me that we're not in our type of environment just yet, right. but you're in an environment where you have some opportunity 
to to make money, maybe a little, in a little bit slower moving stocks. Mm -hmm. And it's worth noting, uh, since we are on the weekly chart here, that this has an earning stability of four. So yeah, I mean, wow. that's a really low earning stability. And a lot of times with these long term leaders, uh, that is one of the characteristics that you'll see. They have a decent EPS growth rate, you know, 14 you know, is, is what Rollins has. Um, but that earning stability, it's just one of those things that you can count on. And that, that kind of fuels its growth, uh, long, long term. Um, let's go ahead and end this out a little bit outside of real estate. We'll just go with, uh, uh, defense stocks. Cause I, you know, a lot of the aerospace defense names, uh, seem like they are getting a, getting a second wind. Of course, you know, when, when the whole Ukraine invasion happened, we were thinking that this is going to be an area that was stronger and it just didn't seem to come to fruition. You know, despite all of these European nations that were saying that they were going to up their defense budgets, it was really kind of a short lived move. But now some of these are coming back, you know, whether it's Northrop or Lockheed Martin, um, you know, it just it just seems like there's uh, renewed interest in the area. So here's Heiko, uh, H-E-I is the ticker symbol on this one. And um, another one. It has pretty good earnings stability, earnings stability of 12. EPS growth rate is a little bit, uh, you know, lower at 10%. Uh, it did come off some negative quarters there. But, um, you know, it looks like this is carving the right-hand side of a cup and uh, making its way back to former highs. Uh, what, what do you think, Arusha? Yeah, technically, it's, it's acting well. Relative strength line, very, very strong. For, as you said, building the right-hand side of a cup. It's getting the blue dot, so it's become more of a leader in the market. Now, the problem is, and you, you kind of were getting at this, uh, Justin, is that a lot of these defense stocks, they've just been really, really frustrating, right? If, you, if you're trying to buy them and you're expecting the stocks to go up and trend well, uh, kind of like Rollins on that monthly chart, uh, you're going to be really, really frustrated here. So I, I think it's continuing to frustrate. But Trust me, when everyone's giving up on it, kind of like I'm already sounding like there's no way I would try it, <laughs> like that, right? That's when they go on the really big run. So yeah. it, it probably is getting pretty closer to having a chance here if the market uh, is able to start a nice little uptrend here. So it's worth keeping on the radar. I do like that relative strength line. It's shown that this is one of those groups where there is some leadership. Accelerate. Uh, the, the earnings are kind of de are decelerating when you look over the last number of quarters yeah sales are still pretty steady here so it's it, it's okay I, I guess it's not really our kind of uh, stock now defense stocks can uh, there have been plenty of times where defense stocks have been the place to be but for whatever reason i don't know it, it's weird why they're just kind of not doing anything right now even though you, from a kind of a macro level and a larger trend level, seems like everyone's more willing to invest in uh, defense uh, in, in quite a while, right? It's, it's been a little while since you've just kind of seen this. All these countries are more and more willing to invent, uh, invest in defense stocks. Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe maybe it's one of those things that they they're they're saying right now, and maybe we have to see kind of the enough, the, yeah. the, the, the the checks start coming in. So uh, <laughs> we'll 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 put a pin in that one. But uh, thank you very much to everyone for uh, joining us this week. Uh, hope hope you found that the real estate was something that uh, was uh, educational for you. Again, we're trying to kind of make sure that people know that there are other other ways of investing out there while we do talk mostly about stocks. Um, we want to kind of open other opportunities uh, for you that might be out there. Thank you, Arusha, for joining me as Thank always you. every week, despite your USC helmet in the back. Uh, <laughs> it's still it's still a pleasure to have you despite that. But uh, hope you join us for next week. Uh, we're going to have John Boyk on the show. Uh, right. Really excited for that. Of course, he's written a number of books um, you know, about those monster stocks, those top investors. Um, he's just a big a big student of the market. So it's going to be really great having John Boyk on the show. Uh, really great guy. So hope you join us for that. And thanks for joining us this week. Take care. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you wanna watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.